Networked multiplayer can quickly become a nightmare. They can easily double the development time of your project. Whereas local split screen, well, that's a whole lot easier to implement. And Unity has made it even easier in big thanks to Unity's new input system and some of the tools that it ships with. So in this tutorial, we're going to look at a few things. First, using the built-in systems, mainly the new input system to create local multiplayer, adding optional split screen functionality, modifying existing controller code to use with multiplayer, using C-sharp events to respond when players are added, for example, spawning players at different points in the map or toggling objects on and off. And finally, we're gonna look at using Cinemachine with split screen functionality. We are not going to look at creating a player selection screen, but it is very possible with this system. So leave me a comment down below if that's of interest. Now, there's also a bit of crudeness to how Unity splits the screen. It initially splits left and right, and you can't choose to do the other. Also, if the split screen sizes don't fill the screen, which means, for example, if three player screens will not cover the entire screen, that'll leave some artifacts in the remaining unused part of the screen. Now, these issues are fixable, but those fixes would require some customization that is beyond the scope of this tutorial. Also worth noting, I'll be using the character controller from my third person controller video for this tutorial. Although any character controller using the new input system should work equally well. And lastly, if you're just here for the code, there's a link in the description down below. Feel free to check that out. So what is actually happening? Well, there's a lot going on behind the scenes to create split screen functionality, most of which is handled by two components, player input manager and player input. Both of these components ship with a new input system. Now, while these classes are not simple, one of them 700 lines and the other is 2000 lines, the end result is pretty straightforward and very easy to use. The player input manager detects when a button on a new device is pressed. When that happens, a prefab with a player input component is instantiated. The player input creates an instance of an input action asset and assigns the device to that instance. The prefab that is instantiated could be the player object, but in reality, it's just holding a reference to the input action asset for a given player and a device. So if you want to allow players to select their character or perform some other action before jumping into the game, you could connect the character selection UI elements to the input action asset. And then when the player object is created, you can connect that object to the input action asset. And this becomes even easier if you create additional action maps, one for selection and one for in-game action. That makes your head spin a little bit, that's okay. The input system isn't simple, but it is really powerful. So here's what needs to happen to get started. First, we're gonna to need to add in the new input system to your project. We're gonna do that through the package manager. And if you haven't played around with the new input system, definitely check out my earlier video on that system covering the basics of how that works. Next, we're gonna to have to create an input action asset. We wanna make sure we save that and generate the C-sharp class. Next, we're gonna add in the player input manager component to a scene object. After that, we're gonna create a player prefab and add the player input component. With that done, we'll assign the input action asset to the player input component. And our last step is to assign the player prefab with the player input component to the player input manager. And with that done, we can kick Unity into play mode and press a button on your keyboard or mouse and you should see a character prefab get instantiated. And if you have an additional controller, press a button and another prefab should be created. In some cases, I have seen Unity treat multiple devices all as one. This occurred when I connected the devices before setting up the player input manager. And for me, a quick restart of Unity resolved these issues. Now, before we move on, there's a little refinement here. I've had some issues with Unity detecting the mouse and keyboard as separate devices. One way to resolve this is by defining control schemes, but to be honest, I haven't quite found the secret sauce to make that work smoothly and consistently. Another way around this is in the input player manager to set the join behavior to join players when join action is triggered, and then create a join action in the input action asset. For me, I set the join action to any key on the keyboard and the start button on the gamepad, and it all works really smoothly. If you want each player to have their own camera, for example, in a first person shooter, the next step is to make sure that the player prefab has a camera component so that when each player object is instantiated, it has its own camera object. In my case, the camera and the player object need to be separate objects, and I'd guess this is true for many games. To make this work, simply create an empty object and make the camera and the player objects children of the empty. Then create a new prefab from the empty object with the attached children and assign this prefab 
to the player input manager. The player input component, in my experience, can go on any object in the prefab. So put it where it makes most sense to you. I kept mine on the player object itself rather than on the empty parent. Now you may have noticed that the player input component has a camera field. So on the prefab, assign the camera to that slot. This is needed so that the split screen can be set up correctly. The last step before testing is to click the split screen toggle on the player input manager. After that, Unity should handle the rest. So kick it back into play mode, press a button on your keyboard, press a button on your controller, and you should get two player objects and the screen split in half. If you're using Cinemachine for your camera control, you should still get split screen functionality, but all the views are likely looking through the same camera, and we'll fix that in a bit. If you've been playing around with a player object that has a controller component, you may have noticed that all the players are still being controlled by a single device, even if you have split screen working. To fix this, we need the controller component to reference the input action asset on the player input component. And to do that, we're going to need to jump into our code. We're going to need to modify our character controller script. What we need to do is change the type of our input action asset from whatever specific type you've created, in my case that was third person action asset, to the more general input action asset. We can then get a reference to the player input component with get component or get component in children, depending on the structure and location of your components. Then to access the input action asset, we need to add dot actions to the end of that. And now for the messy bit, since there's no way to know what type of input action asset we're using with our player input, we need to find the action maps and individual actions using strings. I don't like it, but it does work. We can get references to our action maps using find action maps and references to our actions using find actions. Do take care to spell the names correctly with the correct capitalization. And that is all we need to do. We've updated the references to our input action asset, our action maps, and the actions themselves. The rest of your controller code can all stay the same. Give it a quick test and each player object should now be controlled by a unique device. If you want to control where players spawn or maybe turn off a scene overview camera once that first player spawns in, we're going to need to add in a bit more functionality. Unity gives us an on player join and on player left action that we can subscribe to and allows us to do stuff when a player joins. In addition, the on player join action sends a reference to the player input component, which turns out to be very useful. To make use of this action, we need to change the notification behavior on the player input manager to invoke C sharp events. Unity won't throw an error if this isn't set correctly, but the actions won't get invoked. To demonstrate how to control where players spawn, let's create a new player manager class. This class will need access to the unity.input system, so make sure to add that using statement at the top. The first task is to get a reference to the player input manager component, and I've done that with find object of type. We can then subscribe and unsubscribe from the on player join action. In my case, I subscribed an add player function that takes in the player input component. Now there are several ways to make this work, but I chose to create a list of the player input components, effectively keeping a reference to all the spawn players, as well as a list of transforms that will function as in-game spawn points. These spawn points can be absolutely anything, but I've chosen to use empty game objects. Then when a player joins, I add the player input component to the list and then set the position of the player object to the corresponding transforms position in the spawn list. I've kept it simple so that player one always spawns into the first location, player two to the second location, and so on and so on. Because of the structure of my player prefab, I'm setting the position of the parent, not the character object. My player input component is also not on the prefab root object, so your code may look a bit different if your prefab is structured differently. If the only camera objects in your scene are part of the player objects, that means that players may see a black screen until the first player joins, which is fine for testing, but isn't exactly polished. A quick way to fix this is to add a camera to the scene and attach a component that will toggle the camera off when a player joins. And yeah, you could leave the camera on, but this would make the computer work harder than it needs to, as it would do an additional and unseen rendering of the scene. So just like above when controlling the spawn location, we need a new component that has access to the input system and will subscribe to the on player join action. Then we just need a simple function subscribe to the action that will toggle the game object off. Couldn't be much simpler than that. Now this of course can be extended and used in as many ways as you need. Play a sound effect, update UI, whatever you need. 
the C Sharp event makes it very easy and very powerful. So if you're using more than one camera with Cinema Machine, your project is probably looking and acting a bit funky, and we need to do a bit more work. We need to get each virtual camera working with and talking to a different Cinema Machine brain. This is done by putting the virtual camera on a specific layer and then setting the camera's cooling mask accordingly. The first step is to create new layers for each possible player. In my case, I've set the player limit in the player input manager component to four, and I've created four layers called player one through player four. Then to make this easier, or really just a bit less error prone once I've set it up, I've added a list of layer masks to the player manager component. One layer mask for each player that can be added. The value for the layer masks can then be set in the inspector, nice and easy. Then comes the ugly part. Layer masks are bit masks and layers are integers. We got some work to do. Now I'm sure there are other ways to do this, but our first step is to convert our player layer mask, which is a bit mask, to a layer, which is an integer. So on our player manager component and in the add player function, we do the conversion with the help of a base two logarithm. Why base two? Think binary and powers of two. In my case, the player input component, which is what we get a reference to from the on player join action, is not on the parent object. So I first need to use a reference to the parent transform and then search for the Cinemachine free look and camera components in the children. If you are using a different virtual camera, you'll need to search for the type that you are using. Once we have referenced the Cinemachine virtual camera component, we can set the game object layer to the layer integer value we created above. For the camera's cooling mask, it's a bit more work as we don't want to just set the layer mask, we need to add our player layer to the mask. And this gets done with the black magic that is bitwise operations. CodeMonkey has a pretty decent video explaining some of how this works, albeit in a slightly different context, and I'll make sure to put a link down below. If everything is set up correctly, we should be able to test our code and have each Cinemachine camera looking at the correct player, which is pretty sweet. But you might still see an issue depending on your camera and how it's being controlled. If you're using a Cinemachine input handler to control your camera, you are likely still seeing all the cameras controlled by a single device. This is because the Cinemachine input handler is using an input action reference, which connects to the input action asset, which is a scriptable object, not the instance of the input action asset in the player input. And yes, if that all sounds like gibberish, you gotta love the naming of the new input system. Anyways, to fix this, we're going to need to create our own input handler. So we're going to copy and modify the get access value function from the original Cinemachine input handler. This function takes in an integer related to an axis and returns a float value from the corresponding action. Note that this component implements the I input access provider interface. This is what the Cinemachine virtual camera looks for to get its input. We then need to add one more line to our add player function in our player manager to assign the actions to this input handler. With that done, replace the Cinemachine input handler with this new component and you should be good to go. So there you go. Hopefully that was interesting and better yet useful for you and your project. And until next time, happy game designing.